Welcome to today's presentation sponsored by Seal Aftermarket Products. We want to thank Seal Aftermarket for making these webinars available to everyone for free. Now let's play a short video from Seal Aftermarket. Seal Aftermarket Products engineers and manufactures Toledo Transkit the most trusted and complete kits in the industry for 25 years. Toledo Transkit gives you more critical components, more OE components, like premium seals and gaskets, more design enhancements, patented components, and all the little extras you won't find elsewhere. At Seal Aftermarket Products, we don't just make kits, we make kits better. Toledo Transkit is the number one choice of installers because of all the intensive research and development that goes into each component in every kit. Like re-engineered valve body gaskets, preventing EPC damage by eliminating the shredding you get from original equipment. Plus, all of the extra essentials that are included, like spring and screen filters that should be changed at overhaul. Toledo Transkit even includes loose valve body gaskets that fit all 19 bonded separator plates. When servicing Honda and Acura transmissions, shaft nuts are quite often damaged during removal. Toledo Transkit provides all the main shaft, secondary shaft, and counter shaft nuts, so you don't have to try to reuse the originals or pay extra for them at the dealer. Honda Acura kits also include valve body screen filters, pressure tap washers, and other important components like bolt locks, roll pins, and pistons. What you get is a complete kit with great fit and no wasted time or worry about ordering extra parts. If you want the best sealing transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Trans Kit by name. Okay, if you have any questions or comments, please send us emails to webinars at APRA.com. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to text them to me, and I will try to answer those the best that I can. Here's a list of the upcoming webinars that we have this year, and the next one will be June 2nd and 3rd, and we'll be covering the rebuild and internal parts of the ZF8 HP. This is the dates for the expo this year. It will be held at the Rio in Vegas like it was last year. And the dates are October 29th to November 1st, Halloween weekend. Here are the locations and dates for the rest of the seminars that we have around the states this year. The next one will be May 30th in Vancouver. As well as the door prizes that are given um, from the vendors and suppliers that uh, attend the seminar. Uh, ATRA this year will be giving away at each seminar a free expo package. That's the entire package covering uh, all the tech seminars or management seminars you want to go to, as well as the trade uh, show. It also includes four nights stay at the Rio. So we have your hotel and seminar covered. Uh, just have to pay the expenses to get to the seminar and uh, obviously for food and etc. We also give away this year um, at each seminar the uh, management package. Uh, that one does not include the uh, room for the uh, Rio. And we give away one month free tech uh, support, as well as last year's uh, expo book, which is over 800 pages of tech. So those are the giveaways that ATRA is providing at all of our seminars. Today's presentation will be about the Subaru Linear-Tronic CVT. Now this uh, transmission uh, construction comes in basically four sections. You have the bell housing, the main case, intermediate case, and extension housing. There is a generation two that's much smaller. Uh, it only comes in three sections, the bell housing, main case, and extension housing. It doesn't have an intermediate case. 
Now, to take this transmission apart, we started at the back of the unit. It seemed much easier. Uh, we removed all the tail housing bolts, took the tail housing off, as you see here on the left. And once we do that, just like any other uh, Subaru you've ever worked on, you'll notice the transfer clutch assembly, output shaft, and the transfer clutch hub is right there. And you have the transfer gear, as well as the parking uh, mechanism. And also we want to mention here, there's a shim that goes actually in the back of the tail housing for that uh, transfer gear. So we don't want to mislocate that. I want to keep all the shims that we find in this transmission at the correct locations. Now, once all these components are removed from the uh, back of the intermediate case is what we're looking at here. Um, to remove the intermediate case, uh, we're going to have to take all the bolts out, as you see, around the edge of the intermediate case. And then also we have that one hidden bolt that we're showing you here. Uh, all these components come out of the intermediate case uh, fairly easy. Now, once we get the transfer uh, clutch assembly on the bench, you'll see that there's five clutch plates, five steels, and there's also two pressure plates. There's two bearings that you can see here on the bottom right. There's a sleeve bearing as well as a thrust bearing that goes inside that drum. The clutch clearances should be between 28 to 43 thousandths. Although Subaru says you can, uh, if the clutch clearance goes over 63, they want you to go ahead and replace all the clutches. And there's uh, four different selective clutch pack kits available for this. So make sure you measure all your plates when you're uh, ordering uh, a new set. Now this is the intermediate case removed from the back of the main case. Uh, we, we removed it from there, we turned it around, so now we're looking into the front of the intermediate case. As you can see, this is where the reverse clutch is located. There's a loop filter uh, located in this case also, and you can see the reverse clutch stack up right there. Now there's five clutches and five steels here also, and there's a bevel cushion plate. Uh, the bevel cushion plate's inside edge actually rides on the reverse clutch piston. Now the clearance for this clutch is in your handout. It should be 113 to 125 uh, inch, 125,000 inch. And the pressure plate comes in four different selections also to get the clearance correct. And we're showing you a better picture here of the bevel cushion plate of the inside edge actually faces down inside the uh, assembly against the uh, piston. Now, what we're doing here is we, we've removed the intermediate case. We're looking at the back side of the main case. And here you can see the planetary, which is actually um, going into the forward drum. And once we remove the planetary and forward drum assembly, uh, there's a shim that sometimes falls out and gets mislocated. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose this or uh, put it in the wrong area. It has to go uh, the way you see here, right on the back of the drum itself. There's another bevel cushion plate here with six steels and six clutches. Now, the clearance for this clutch is 47 to 63 thousandths. And there's also four different selective uh, selections to choose from if you're ordering a set of clutches for this. Now, to do the end plate check on this clutch, it's much easier to uh, leave the forward clutch hub out. And as you see here in the bottom left, we can go ahead and just uh, put the pressure plate and snap ring in. And we can use a field gauge and go in there and check the clutch clearance. When we're going back together with the transmission, it's much easier to take the planetary uh, out of the forward drum and just place it or spline it into the reverse clutches, as you see here. Uh, we would put the planetary down in there and spline it with the clutches um, so that when we go back together with the two case halves, it's much easier to rotate the planet to get the gears to align um, to get the two case halves back together. Uh, trying to do it otherwise, you'd have to try to move uh, the planet so that the actual hub section uh, lined up with all the clutches, and it's uh, more difficult to do it that way. We found it's much easier to place the planetary into the intermediate housing, uh, slide into the reverse clutch first. 
Let's have a look at the forward clutch assembly. As you can see here on the right, we have a thrust bearing. It's directional. We uh, show you with a little drawing which way it goes. Then there's a spacer. Then we can put the forward clutch, uh, forward clutch hub with the sun gear assembly down on top of that. And then we have another directional thrust bearing. And obviously, once all that's set in there, we can go ahead and put the ring gear and the snap ring in. Now, there's a transfer gear assembly at the uh, where at the back of the forward drum with the forward clutch assembly would actually go through. Uh, this doesn't need to be removed, but you could remove it if you like. Make sure that uh, the bearing is good. There's no debris caught up in there. And you can see there's a stationary dowel pin that has to line up with a cutout in the case. Now, when it comes to removing the valve body, uh, there's there's 12 valve body bolts that we have shown here in red. Uh, they're all the dark colored bolts. There's only one bolt longer than the rest. Uh, the three bolts that you see here circled in blue are actually the bolts that would hold the filter on. Uh, basically, the filter was removed and the three bolts were put back there just to uh, keep them in the correct location. Now, we have to take the valve body off and there's a couple of tubes we have to get to underneath in order to be able to remove the main case from the bell housing. Now, if we stand it up on the bell housing, uh, you can see here we can remove the two uh, tubes that we were talking about earlier. Uh, the one on the right is actually made of steel. The other one is uh, plastic. Now, you can see why we have to remove the plastic when obviously it goes all the way down and through to the uh, uh, pump suction area. And this section of the case that you see here around this steel tube is actually part of the bell housing. So in order to be able to slide the case past that, we're going to have to take that tube out. We go ahead and remove the rest of the bolts from the bell housing. And now we can separate the main case, as you see here on the right. We just slide it right up and right up off the bell housing. You may have to pry a little bit, but once you pry it loose, it should come up fairly easily. Now, when the case is off, we need to remove some of the feed tubes. Uh, the one, uh, is especially the one that you see here, it's about a half inch in diameter. It's about six inches long. It's uh, right located right there on the passenger side. So before we can pull any of these pulleys off, as you can see, there's some retainer bolts located here, and there's another one here that hold these pulleys down too. Uh, the bell housing. So those will have to be removed and it's easier to remove the uh, the chain and the guides and these other tubes before we can get to that. Now to get the chain loose and off there you get this uh, special tool that we're showing you here. The tool uh, number is actually in your handout material. Uh, we give you the website where you can order that tool. We've also seen it available at places like Napa, CarQuest, uh, we've even seen it at Sears online. They don't have it stocked at the stores, uh, but they do have it, uh, access to getting it to, through their internet. You can also check around on Amazon or like eBay, places like that, and you'll find that the tool roughly runs around $342. Now this puller is going to go on this lip that you see here. We don't want to put the jaws of the puller down here lower because we don't want to damage that area where the chain rides. So it's good to place the puller right here on that lip, and then we can uh, compress that spring. Now, this spring is extremely strong, so you have to be very careful here. Uh, that's why we want you to remove the, the, any of these tubes, and also we're going to be removing the chain guides. But once all that stuff's out of the way, uh, then we can go ahead and lift the chain off. Again, be very careful here. We don't want to have our fingers between the chain and the actual pulleys in case the tool was to slip off. Now here's the two uh, chain guides that we were talking about. They're plastic. They're both of, there's two of them in here. They're both the same. But it's really important that we go through the procedure of removing uh, all these guides and these tubes so that once we want to remove the chain, uh, we don't have too many things to have to work around.
Now, these two chain guides are the same, so you don't have to worry about mixing them up. They can go either way. Uh, you can see there's one here on the passenger side and one on the other side. Um, you can see that they actually go to a guide pin, and the other one actually goes to a guide feed tube. So a closer look at the chain guide itself. As you can see here, they're identical. Just a matter of uh, unclipping the two clips that you see there, the locking tabs. And you can see where the tube uh, or guide pin goes right there at that opening on the chain guide. Now, once we have the pulleys off and we want to disassemble them, uh, at this point in time, there's no aftermarket uh, kit that I know of that have any of the seals or rings that go inside these pulleys. Uh, but just the same, we'd want to take these apart so we can at least check the seals. If there's no damage to the sheaths on the pulleys themselves where the chain rides, then we want to go in there and clean out any debris and check the seals to see if they're going to be good. If this way here, we'll know that there's not going to be any slipping issues or any problems with these seals by going in there and cleaning them out and checking out the seals. At this point in time, Seal Aftermarket Products is uh, working on creating a kit. Now, on this primary pulley, there's no spring to worry about here. Uh, where you see the pulling tools being actually uh, grabbing what's a cylindering groove. Now, these usually come off fairly easy, uh, but the one that we were working on was pretty tight and it would actually cause damage to the cylindering groove. So we used a uh, gear puller and we put it underneath that uh, section of the ceiling groove to get a better uh, area to pull on without damaging any of the uh, ceiling room areas. And this is the exploded view of the primary pulley. And you see the, the nut comes off first, and we have a bearing in the bearing retainer. That's the retainer I was talking about earlier that would actually attach uh, the pulley down to the bell housing. And then we have the shell. And underneath that shell, there's a retainer with a sealing ring on it. And that sealing ring, I'm showing you down here at the bottom left, is a stepped sealing ring. Then we have a rubber D-ring on the inner area of the neck shell. And that uh, sealing ring you're looking at there is another step sealing ring that actually goes uh, to the applied pulley. And the bottom right, we're just showing you the bottom view of that applied pulley. All this will assemble down onto the stationary pulley, the pulley that stays stationary, only this side of the pulley moves. At the top of that shaft, you'll see two more sealing rings that also step. So again, if we don't have any damage on either side of the pulley with the chains ride, it's a, it's a good idea to go in here and, and check these seals and make sure everything's good and clean. Now, this is the secondary pulley disassembly. As you can see here, we're using an actual gear puller on this one. Now, this has a street, uh, spring in it that's extremely strong. We want to be careful when we disassemble this because parts will go flying around on the bench. So you remove the nut, and then that sleeve that you see there just below the nut is kind of a press fit. So we're going to need this tool to slide that off. What we found was much safer and easier to do to remove this is we actually took the uh, puller tool and the whole assembly and we put it inside the presses you see here. We flipped it over. We have the pulling tool on the bottom. Now we pump the press down all the way. We set it up so we can pump this down all the way to the top of the pulley assembly. Now uh, once we go down here and we pull off the sleeve, uh, the spring tension is retained by the, the uh, pressure on the press. And we can slowly release the press and allow it to, to come up without any parts flying around. Now we have the secondary pulley assembly uh, disassembled here. And you can see the nut on the left. There's our bearing race. And then we have a retaining ring and a molded piston. We want to make sure there's no damage to this piston also. We need these these pistons and these seals to, to seal the pulley so we don't have any slip issues. And then after that, we have the, uh, the gear that you saw earlier, and you can see there's a, a step sealing ring on that. And there's that very large and strong return spring. And then down inside the applied pulley, you'll find an oil baffle. And the upper right, we're just showing you the bottom side of that pulley. 
And then we have the stationary pulley, and as you can see to the right, it has a couple bearings and a uh, retainer to keep that bolted down to the bell housing. And on the bottom right, you see the molded piston bottom view. I'll talk a little bit more about this molded piston. There's a couple of tabs, one on each side of it. And as you can see in the applied pulley, there's a couple of cutouts for those tabs to align with. The same thing with the oil baffle that's down inside the drum. I'm sorry, down inside the pulley itself. It also has two tabs that will line up with uh, two notches in the bottom of the pulley. And there's a closer look at the gear with the ceiling ring. Again, we want to make sure all this stuff is going to be good if we have to reuse it. Now, once the pulleys and all the uh, parts and components have been removed from the uh, back of the bell housing, you're going to see this pinion support here. Uh, there's several bolts here. We just have to take all these bolts out. And then we can inspect the differential. You'll notice the differential on this one is pretty well smoked. Um, I've talked to several techs across the country. Uh, the only time we see these come into the shop like this is after it's been to some type of uh, quick loop facility. Uh, they drain all the fluids out of the transmission and the uh, differential, not realizing that there's a separate fill for the differential. So this is the, the only time we actually see this problem happen. Uh, we talked about earlier in the uh, introduction of this transmission, the only other problems we were seeing was the update to the torque converter. So they had a thrust washer that was wearing into the uh, support, uh, causing it to uh, cut off lube and chug the engine down. Uh, the later ones all have uh, a bearing in there now, and we don't seem to be getting calls on that anymore. So just like any other Subaru, the differential setup is the same. The only difference here is once we remove this pinion support, uh, on the other side you'll find that there's a pump attached to it. And this is what it would look like. You can see the pinion gear in here is pretty well wiped out. So we have the support off. And you can see the pump is actually bolted to it from the other side. And the shaft of the pump would actually come out through the front uh, of the bell housing. Now to remove the pump from here, you just need to remove the four dark colored bolts. And then the pump will come right off. And you can also see there's a couple of seals to seal the pump up against the uh, pinion support. Here's an exploded view of the pump. We have a pump cover, there's a shaft, there's two pump gears, and then the pump body. Now the pump gears will go down inside the pump body with the two ID marks facing up. Then we can place the shaft down onto the inner pump gear. And as you can see, there's a bearing here and also one on the cover. So once we put the gears down inside the body, we take the pump shaft. And you can see the bearing was right on this uh, end of the shaft. We have a keyway that will fit right inside the inner pump gear. And then when the cover comes down, the other bearing will ride in this area. Okay, once we've gotten past that section, we're going to now uh, tip the bell housing over so we can get to the front of it. And as you can see here, we have a uh, stator support that has to be removed. Normally, when you take all the bolts out of this section, you just take all of these out. Uh, normally, you can just tap on it, and the whole clutch assembly will come out the way you see it right here in the middle. We have a primary reduction gear here. The input clutch assembly is there. And then obviously we have the input shaft with the input gear at the other end. And then we also have the stator shaft. As you can see here with it all removed, uh, you can see where the actual pump shaft comes through the front of the bell housing. Uh, once we remove this section, we want to go in there and check, uh, make sure that these three O-rings don't get uh, mislocated. There's two larger ones here. And as you can see, the small inner one is already missing on this side. And make sure that we uh, keep these in place or replace them during rebuild. Now, looking at the input clutch assembly, uh, first thing we have is this cover that you see right here. We just left these two bolts and hold it on there. If we remove the cover where the front uh, converter seal is, you'll see the stator support is just bolted down inside of this. Now, once we take the whole uh, stator support section and flip it over, 
you'll see on this side is a converter hub drive gear. This drives a chain, and then obviously this bearing will spline onto the shaft that we saw coming through the bell housing uh, for the pump itself. You know, going back to the other one, it's much easier to go ahead and put the input shaft along with the input clutch assembly into the case. You can see our pump shaft is here. Um, then we can go ahead and put this assembly back. Uh, what we want to mention here, though, inside uh, this back cover, there's also two more shims. So we want to make sure we keep them in the correct location. So we can grease these in place, set up everything like you see here, make sure our O-rings are all in place, and then we can go ahead and just slide the cover uh, back onto it. Now let's look at the uh, actual input clutch assembly itself. Uh, we take the uh, input shaft off. We have a ceiling in here, a white ceiling in here. And we also have an O-ring for the torque converter clutch. we we'll make sure that we put those back in place and not damage them when we go back together. Now in order to get the piston out of the inside of the drum here, we're actually going to have to either press or pull off this bearing from the actual clutch hub. This hub turns free into the actual clutch supply. It's not on there very tight. It's pretty easy to, to either press it off or go ahead and put a puller tool on it. Either way, we need to get that bearing off to get the hub out. Now, what you're going to find inside here is there's no clutch material uh, on these steels. They're just uh, internally, externally splined steels. Now, the way this works is the uh, input clutch comes on only after the engine reaches a certain RPM over 400. Now, the way they do this is obviously once the engine starts, the pump will start to turn first. And uh, once the pressure starts to build up in the pulleys, they don't want that to, to drag the engine down during startup. So they won't apply this clutch until after the engine reaches the, the correct RPM. And then once this clutch is on, it stays on. It's not a shifting clutch. It actually stays on until the engine is shut off. So they felt it wasn't necessary to put any clutch material here. We just got uh, steel on steel. So there's six internally splined and five, uh, I'm sorry, six externally splined and five internally splined plates. And we want to keep that clearance between 94 to 110 uh, inch. Now, the bevel plate here goes down the same way we were talking about earlier with the reverse clutch. Now, solenoids. There's seven solenoids in this unit. You have a secondary linear control solenoid. You have all the resistance for all the solenoids in the handout material. All the solenoids are fed, uh, controlled by the uh, PCM and grounded at the valve body. Now, the primary up down and lock of duty solenoids are all normally closed and they are fully interchangeable. So they all have the same type of flow rate. Uh, the lock up on off solenoid is the only on off style solenoid. What we want to do here is pay close attention to the solenoid wires, especially the grounds that are attached to the valve body bolt. We don't want to over uh, twist the eyelets or pull on the wiring. Uh, we have to have a good ground here because obviously they will set solenoid codes. Um, if we uh, damage the uh, grounds to the uh, solenoids. What we're looking at here is the secondary linear control solenoid. This is the one that controls the pressure to the pulleys. Uh, basically, it's our pulley line pressure. Uh, this pressure goes high as 900 PSI. Now, the main regulator for this is actually inside the snout of the uh, solenoid. Now, we took this one apart to just give you an idea uh, how the uh, hydraulics work. There's two balanced orifices built into the valve, and the orifice A is balanced oil for the main regulator. It keeps the valve balanced, uh, much like any other normal pressure regulator would work. Now, this solenoid works on about 2,000 hertz, so that's pretty fast. It keeps the pressure control nice and smooth. Obviously, with high mileage, this is something that we want to uh, replace during rebuild. Any problems occur with the solenoid, the TCM basically shuts the transmission off, 
uh, check the solenoid off, and we'll go to max line pressure. Obviously, this is going to cause like harsh engagements, forward and reverse, and it'll also inhibit lockup. But the transmission will continue to adjust the gear ratios like normal. In your handout, you also have the function for the rest of the solenoids, how each one of them function. We have the lockup on off, the lockup duty, primary up and down. And we have the forward reverse linear solenoid, as well as the transfer case clutch solenoid. Now, TCM identifies the wheel slip by monitoring wheel speed and transmission output speed. Now, if this cylinder or the circuits fail, all the torque is going to be sent to the front wheels. And the actual rear differential won't operate if it has uh, a rear differential operation with clutch pack in there, too. Now, like any other Subaru we've ever dealt with, if there are any uh, circuit faults with the solenoids, Obviously, the AT temp light will flash. It will store a code. Uh, once the system uh, picks up any kind of a fail-safe code, it just cuts off the power of the transmission. At this point, the transmission is going to take off in a higher gear ratio. It will feel like the transmission is slipping or like it has no power on takeoff. Now, once we remove the valve body, we want to be careful here. We want to keep the separator plate up against the upper valve body. As you can see here, there's several small parts that could get lost or misplaced. There's three check valves. Each one has its own spring. We give you all the spring dimensions in the handout so you can locate the correct spring for the, for the right check valve. Now, you'll, you will not find any check valves located anywhere in any parts of the valve body. Now, Subaru doesn't provide any valve body information or valve names uh, anywhere in any of their uh, material as far as factory uh, manuals or whatsoever. Uh, the valve body is sold as one piece with all the solenoids on it. The valves that you see identified here were, was done by ATRA. Uh, our tech, Jared, worked extensively on this. He followed all the hydraulic circuits to each valve so we could name the valve for the circuit that it was working with. This is the lower valve body. We have all the spring dimensions here. Again, there's no check valve located here either. All right, let's talk a little bit about the hydraulic passage identifications uh, throughout the different parts of the case. Uh, as you can see here, we'll start at the bell housing. We have our status support removed. Uh, the three places we were talking about earlier for the O-rings. And the upper left is secondary pressure, converter apply in the middle. And then we have lockup release just below that to the right. And we also have this loop tube we have to be careful with also. Now, on the back side of that uh, support cover, and we have a lube orifice there. We also have where the secondary pressure comes through. And you can see there's a seal on that tube also. We have to be uh, careful not to damage that. And that should be replaced during overhaul. And there's your converter apply circuit as well. Okay, we swing the bell housing around. Looking at the back side here, we have a lube tube at the top. And we have that tube there on the right for the, the, for the converter on pressure. And the input shaft and lockup off pressure goes through that uh, area there in the middle. And you can notice that there's the O-ring missing here. This should also have an O-ring in that location. And then we have the secondary pressure to the right. And if the differential was filled correctly, that would be the differential oil fill level right there. Now, on the pump itself, we're looking here at the left at the state of the uh, pinion support. And there's two O-rings that go here for the when the pump bolts up. And the left side is the pump inlet and the pump outlet to the right. We also identify that for you on both halves of the uh, pump assembly itself. So we're now looking now at the front of the uh, main case. 
And you can see here the converter pressure tube, the seal there that goes down into that hole. And then just to the bottom right of that is the converter off pressure, which is the actually back of the input tube. And then we have the two guides that are also I have lube oil going through them. And there's lube at the back of that sleeve bearing to the bottom right. And right there in the back of the primary up and down pressure is at the uh, top bearing. Uh, that's where the pressure goes through there. And over here on the right, we're looking at the, uh, obviously with the forward clutch and everything assembled. We're looking at the back of the main case. And here you can see that we have the transfer clutch oil, lube oil for the other side of where that filter would be, and also the reverse feed. Looking back again at the front of the intermediate case, there's our reverse clutch feed, and there's the lube hole that goes to that uh, inner filter for the lube right there. And we've also identified all the hydraulic passages on the valve body. So using that information, uh, we can also obviously give you the uh, same uh, case ports and all identify all the hydraulics there. Uh, this is really good information if we wanted to uh, have this transmission all assembled except for the valve body. And we can go in there and actually check the forward clutch and reverse clutch and even the transfer case uh, clutch oil. We can do some good air checks here to check the transmission out before putting the valve body on. Uh, back to the bottom of the main case where the bell housing is, the steel tube that we talked about earlier was for pressure, and the plastic one is for suction. Now that takes us to the external pressure ports, and this would be on the right side or passenger side of the transmission. And as you see here on the right is the secondary pressure location. We can get to that tap right there. Now looking down in the left photo on the bottom, just below what we were looking at as far as where the vent tube goes, the secondary pressure switch would go in that upper hole. And then we also have another secondary pressure or line tap for the pulleys just below that to the right. And then we also have the converter charge just to the left of that. Now down closer to the linkage area where the uh, manual level position sensor would be, we have lockup off oil. We can actually check forward clutch here. And down to the bottom left, we can actually check the reverse clutch too. So this is really nice to have these pressure tests located here so we can do pressure tests right there on the outside of the transmission. Now on the driver's side or the left side of the trans, you can see we uh, have identified the two cooler lines. The top cooler is feed to the radiator. And then the bottom one is the uh, from the cooler back to the transmission. So that's the return, which is the lube oil for the transmission itself. We can check lube pressure right there in the middle of the case. And to the right in the uh, intermediate case, you can see we have a tap for the transfer clutch. We also have the rear lube tap and the secondary pulley lube tap. There's quite a few taps that we can do uh, pressure tests from on this transmission. At this point in time, this is the only chart I've uh, found available for doing any pressure tests. Uh, the secondary line pressure is the most important one as far as the pulleys go. Um, as you can see in the bottom chart, it's for the transfer case clutch. I'm sure that if you were checking any of the other clutches in the uh, transmission itself, uh, they'd be pretty close to what we're looking at here. That about does it for today's presentation, sponsored by uh, Seal Aftermarket Products. If you have any questions, please feel free to text them to me now. And I want to thank you all for attending.